Yeah, this is Billiam Tice. I have to admit I'm very intimidated to talk about Spy Kids. I feel like everything I've done on this channel up until now has just been practice to talk about Spy Kids. Spy Kids is essentially a quintessential piece of cinema from the 2000s, and it really is quintessential. What'd you do? Your parents are international spies, but something's gone wrong. My parents can't be spies. They're not cool enough. This crazy franchise by Robert Rodriguez is remembered for being as goofy as it is absurd, but it was also just really f***ing cool. It's these charismatic children doing action and comedy, and it feels like it's a world created by kids. It was described as Willy Wonka meets James Bond, and I genuinely don't think there's a better description for these films. It's just batch absurd imagination and pretty cool action. <laughs> So to call it cool? Yeah, I'm scared to call Spy Kids cool. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I think Spy Kids as a franchise and other children's films by Robert Rodriguez like Shark Boy and Lava Girl have really just been memed on by meme meanies. But I think Spy Kids deserves to have a little respect put on their sleeves. He's not the guy. Yeah, it's the guy. It's silly. It's funny. We get it. I but the meme isn't funny. The moment is funny in the movie. <laughs> he was an American actor and producer. He's best known for his portrayal of the guy in Spy Kids 3D Game Over. And then Frodo Baggins. Um, that's the best. Okay, but the memes are very funny too. Spy Kids as a franchise and as a trilogy, a trilogy, deserves to be recognized for its unique brand of creativity and storytelling genuinely. Hey, I bet y'all are wondering why I'm dressed like this. But before I tell y'all, let me thank today's sponsor, Cerebral. Cerebral is an online mental health platform that provides access to prescription medication management, counseling, and therapy for anxiety, depression, insomnia, and other conditions, all for a flat monthly rate. In certain states, treatment for ADHD, bipolar, and PTSD are also available. So for the past six months or so, I've been taking a lot of time to address my own mental health. I've needed to address my anxiety, which bled into my filming and into my scripts a lot. And taking care of myself has been why I I've been uploading very slowly as of late. I've been making changes in my life to work towards a healthier me and taking medication and talking to an online therapist have been pretty great tools for me as I make major life and relationship changes. And yeah, I prefer therapy from home. I've done it in person, but sometimes I don't even want to turn on the webcam. And Cerebral allows you to do visits with your provider, therapist, or care counselor online from the comfort and privacy of your home when it's most convenient for you. Comfy, cozy, Therapy. You can start Cerebral with or without insurance. However, Cerebral is in network with certain insurers. Start by filling out a short online form, answering a few questions to help Cerebral understand your symptoms. And from there, you can choose to subscribe to one of three different membership options based on your budget or needs. So this year, champion your mental health. You can click the link in my description to start the questionnaire and get connected with the provider right away. Your first month starts at only $30. And thank you again to Cerebral for sponsoring this video. As for why I'm dressed like this, well, you just gotta respect the drip. <laughs> Directed, written, and produced by Robert Rodriguez, the original Spy Kids films were released between 2001 to 2003. The film trilogy follows Junie and Carmen Cortez, who become spies to save their parents, who are also spies after they've been kidnapped by an evil mastermind who's been capturing spies. They save their parents and then are employed by the CIA, I mean the OSS, as a family, where they go on all sorts of wacky adventures, beat up bad guys, and, you know, learn to appreciate each other. When revisiting these films, I was expecting it to be silly and charming and fun because I know I like Robert Rodriguez, but the thing that pulled me in instantly into thinking that maybe my nostalgia for these movies isn't the sole factor in my appreciation for them is the opening scene in the first film. Carmen and Junie's mom tell them the story of how she met their dad while on a thrilling spy mission, told as a bedtime story removed from the reality of it being about their parents. 
it's really just a piece of exposition, but it sets the tone for a film that's larger than life. With an incredibly strong family dynamic, the chemistry between the families actually pretty ridiculous, with the chemistry only being complemented further by the supporting cast's chemistry, which is also just ridiculous. But what I really appreciate as Spy Kids as a franchise is each film is fun and unique in its own way with a different setting and cast. I also want to discuss all of these films together rather separately because I do think the quality remains consistent throughout even for Spy Kids 3D game over, but of course there's a stipulation to that, which I'll get into later. I know, I know, I know. Can I just talk to myself at least? You are talking to yourself. I am you. Well, it, it is worse than the other two. Me. <laughs> In the first film, Junie and Carmen follow the trail of their parents' capture and learned their dad has developed an important piece of technology, the third brain. They go on a mission, becoming spies themselves to rescue their parents from the host of Junie's favorite TV show, Floops Fooglies, whose weird cast is actually made up from captured former spies. He wants the third brain to create an army of spy kids, but they're robots. Hey, that's my kid. <laughs> You're just not your kid, you sure? <laughs> Junie and Carmen save the day and become members of the OSS with their parents. In Spy Kids 2, Island of Lost Dreams, Junie and Carmen are now spies, but they're upset because they're getting assigned baby missions. They want a big one. No more rinky dink assignments. So Carmen, the hacker that she is, hacks into the OSS to assign themselves a top level mission on a mysterious island island content. <laughs> Their tech doesn't work and they have to use creativity to stop a doomsday device while avoiding being attacked by giant monsters. In Spy Kids 3, game over. Released as Spy Kids 3D, game over. Junie has retired from the OSS, but his sister is missing inside a video game. So he's got to go inside the game to defeat Sylvester Stallone, who put his grandpa in a wheelchair, but forgiveness is the best power at all of all so that he doesn't do anything about it. But then there's this big Avengers get together with all the characters at the end of the movie and it's Somebody ring the dinkster! What I really love about all of these movies is they're just so totally disconnected from actual like spy work. They're all really creative, weird setups and I'm much more akin to like classic children's literature. They go down the rabbit hole, through the wardrobe. Charlie is brought to the chocolate factory. It's, they're just invited into another world and they work for the CIA. <laughs> I love how sometimes the story elements in Spy Kids seem to be instinctive to how a kid would tell a story. Great story, Mom, but it needs a new ending. It needs monsters. Oh, is that right? And that's the story we get here. We get the story where there's a monster. Oh, don't worry. I think it's reversible. And the description that it's Willy Wonka meets James Bond is also really fitting because I feel like Floop's Castle is how a child might imagine a weird show like Teletubbies is produced the same way that that's how a kid might imagine a chocolate factory operates. And just like how Willy Wonka has its own iconography, I really think Spy Kids has its own bizarre iconography and its own imprint onto the cultural lexicon. Yeah, I said cultural lexicon in a Spy Kids video. You think? God. Floop's castle is just so weird and psychedelic as well as all of the creatures. Thumb thumbs with their big old thummy dumpies. All the gadgets are also so weird and imaginative and all of the gizmos look like they're toys. You like toys? I like toys. I'm a toy <laughs> kind of guy. <laughs> and in Spy Kids 2, I love the aesthetic of the island. It's very much an island, I like that. Spy Kids 2 has this very classic Ray Harryhausen kind of feeling to it. The monsters all look kind of janky, like they're stop motion, but that actually gives it a very classic feel and a distinct style. The humor and creativity of the world are totally intertwined with so many little things eliciting a smile and curiosity in each scene. The Thumb Thumbs are floop servant robots, mostly animated in CGI, but when they put on the ninja costumes, they're doing clunky, dopey stunts. It's so charming. I love the scene in the second film when the Secret Service is dancing in sync around the president's daughter. They huddle around her acting as a barrier for Junie who wants a dance. Hilariously, he's able to clear them away and ask for a dance because he, as a spy kid, outranks them. Well, yes. 
aesthetic quality of the technology is appealing. It's also very creative. Dr. Romero uses his miniaturized versions of the creatures on top of a scale model of the island, and they're able to recreate the movements of their larger counterparts. It's an interesting security system. It can serve as exposition for the different types of creatures that roam around the island, or if some spy kids end up there or something. I don't like these kids on my island. They're spying on me. <laughs> And also like there's so much child empowerment and wish fulfillment in these movies. Every single time they have a cool gadget as a kid. And now I was never about it. I didn't like seeing Junie and Carmen just have instant McDonald's. That pissed me off because I wanted instant McDonald's and I knew that shit would never exist. So, and they do it again in the sequel. F you Carmen, keep your greasy McDonald's hands off of my McDonald's Spy Kids toys. Like one Spy Kids toy in every McDonald's Happy Meal. All of the gadgets are very simple, like the rubber band in Spy Kids 2 or the bubble gum in Spy Kids 1. It's just little tiny cool gizmos made out of things a kid could actually hold. And I think both Spy Kids 3 and Shark Boy and Lava Girl, which I'm really not going to get into in this video, kind of abandons that simplicity and loses some of that charm, which is why I think those movies don't uh, hold up as well. They're still fun, but something the Spy Kids movies just does so fucking well that brings all of this together and actually makes it a worthwhile experience to watch is the casting. The Cortez's family's chemistry is so unbelievable. Like I'm all about husband and wife characters who just want to each other like it's just like yes like yeah, they've been married a long time and they're still into it carla gagino is just such a good cool mom but antonio banderas is seen as such a suave guy and they use that to make him like the lamest dad and they put they make him do slapstick all the time the side characters are just wonderful as well the cast in this movie is incredible alan cumming and steve buscemi do a great job of playing these sympathetic antagonists Alan Cumming, of course, is Floop, who runs the children's TV show and just wants to make a good show, but is being directed by everyone around him to create these weapons. He just wants to find out the one thing missing from his show, and it's really sweet when he and Junie sit down and talk, and he appreciates Junie for being a fan of him and actually wants to listen to him. Despite how packed these movies are, they're only about 90 minutes each. They're pretty tight films, but each scene is written to convey the characters so strongly that they're really able to make memorable performances out of each in just a few short scenes. Steve Buscemi plays Dr. Romero, the guilty scientist who has abandoned his creations on the island, all of the funky monsters and stuff. What an iconic role. I mean, I have to mention this line. <laughs> you think God stays in heaven because he too lives in fear of what he's created. I'm 12, I don't, I can't. Do you think God? This line is just so out of left field. It is, uh, of course, everyone remembers it because this is a fucking children's movie. <laughs> Danny Trejo as Machete, who would get a violent spinoff series about six years after Spy Kids. <laughs> It's pretty fucking ridiculous. But I I love him here. Danny Trejo is seen as such a tough guy and Robert Rodriguez has used him that way, but he's just the gadgets guy here. He creates all of the spy gadgets for the kids and I love his gentle but thorough explanation when he's like describing how things work to them. What are you working on? World's smallest camera. I don't see it. Ah, but it sees you. And then of course his big goofy smile when he like comes in to help the family fight all the robots at the end of Spy Kids 1. It's just such a pleasure to see him be that way on, on screen. And then there's a little bit roles like Mike Judge as Donegan Giggles, who is the main villain of the second movie, who also just has like a wonderful defeat. <laughs> just wait till mom finds out you try to take over the world again. No, please, please, please. <laughs> they beat him by telling his wife that he was trying to take over the world. That's so fucking funny. And he's like, no! <laughs> Molly Osment in the second film as Gertie Giggles just kills it. She's so funny. And Robert Rodriguez actually wrote more scenes into the movie with her in it because he wasn't expecting to be able to find a child actor as good as she is. Was. She's no longer a child. <laughs> and I love I love Cheech Marin's arc in the, the films where he first, he's he turns out to not actually be their uncle. He's undercover. <laughs> I'm not your uncle. 
and then they keep calling him their uncle in the second one and he betrays them and he's like, I'm not your uncle. Oh, Felix, how could you? I'm not your uncle. But then in the third one, they need his help. They need their help and he's like, I'm their, I'm uncle. their uncle. It's like, it's so fucking good. But of course, none of the supporting cast would matter if Carmen and Junie, Daryl Sabara and Alexa Vega's dynamic wasn't so incredible. Ew, gross. What do you see? You. Very funny. Focus your eyes closer. There's a really funny sibling rivalry there. They're always bickering with each other, but there's genuine chemistry behind it. Despite the bickering though, the characters have an implicit trust in each other. And by the end of the trilogy, there's a little character arc and they seem to respect each other. Carmen, of course, was such a badass character back in the day. And I thought she was incredible and awesome. But I, I, as an adult watching these, the thing that really sticks out to me is Daryl Serbara's performance. I only dance ballet. What an incredible coincidence. So do I. He's amazing. He's literally the future husband Megan Trainer told us about. <laughs> in the first film, his fear physically affects him through his warts on his hands, which appear because he sweats so much out of being scared so much all the time like a little baby. He's the underdog in the story. Junie is written as such a gentle and innocent character, and Sabara is able to embody that so well. But as Junie becomes a more confident character, his performance is able to carry that kind nature forward with a new confidence. I don't believe they're monsters. Maybe you shouldn't either. Well, what should I believe? I don't know. You're always in here hiding. Maybe they just want to be with you. Be with me? And it's that kind nature that makes Junie quit the OSS and become a gamer. That little DJ. <laughs> no cutting in line, freak. The only misstep in casting in any of these movies is Sylvester Stallone as the collector in the third one. Robert Rodriguez just like hung out with him one day and thought he was like, had more comedy skills than he's been allowed to exhibit in movies. And so he was like, one day I'm gonna write a movie where you have like 30 roles and they're all silly and funny. And he did that and you know, I'm just glad Robert Rodriguez had fun. I speak for all of us when I say, we want out! Hmm. Yeah, it justifies the means. But I kind of respect Robert Rodriguez for hiring Sylvester Stallone just to like, treat him like an action figure for an afternoon or two. The third film is still fun, but I think a lot of its charm comes from the fact that it was like released in like red and blue standard 3D. I think everyone who was a kid in this time remembers these glasses. You're part of the adventure. Spy Kids 3D, game over. Coming soon to 3 DVD. I don't really love the CGI world, but the film does still have a charm to it that is distinctly Spy Kids. Uh, however, the film primarily focuses on Junie with the rest of the cast either being just a cameo role or Carmen taking a much smaller role than in the previous films. The first two films really show that the entire world of Spy Kids was really necessary to make it work, while the third one is just sort of like, yeah. Let's talk about Robert Rodriguez. I wanna kiss him. Well, you know, 20, I want to kiss 23 year old Robert Rodriguez when he was working on his first film, El Mariachi. <laughs> Robert Rodriguez has been a guy for a while now. He's not the guy, but you know, he's some guy in Austin, Texas. Robert Rodriguez got a start in the American independent film scene in the 1990s. He's just chilling. Unlike most indie films, El Mariachi is an action film, which is what makes it notable. Not just people sitting, talking, but people running, shooting. The story's about a case of mistaken identity as a mariachi coming into a small town looking looking for work is mistaken for a rival gang member returning from prison for revenge against a small time drug lord. Rodriguez used all the resources at his disposal to make an exciting and fun film and he absolutely succeeds in that. It premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in September of 1992 and by February of 1993 it had been purchased by Columbia Pictures and received widespread distribution. He's directed Sin City, Spy Kids, Alita, Battle Angel, Desperado, and Machete. He likes action movies and his shit is really fun. He collaborated with Tarantino on a whole lot of things like Grindhouse and Dusk Before Dawn. If you're into filmmaking or anything creative, I highly suggest you did what I did back in high school and literally like yesterday, the day before recording this video and read his book, Rebel Without a Crew. The book. In it, teacher, I mean, 
Professor Robert, I mean, Robert Rodriguez describes his time making El Mariachi. <laughs> All right, so get this, Robert Rodriguez. He was a student at UT Austin. He was making a little cartoon drawing called Los Hooligans, and he really wanted to get into the film program, but he didn't have the grades. So guess what he did? He made better films than the film students and weaseled his way in there by, you know, actually doing the work. But he didn't like how restraining the program at UT Austin was, so he did what I would really recommend any creative person to do and sold his body to medical science for $7,000 to raise funds to create an independent film. Imagine getting some friends, an old film camera, and $7,000 that you receive for lending out your body to medical research and making a movie that's a hit. Being from a Mexican-American family, Robert Rodriguez wanted to use his connections back home in Mexico to create a film for the Spanish video market, which he could sell and then raise enough money to make a better film with. There's my camera wrapped in a t-shirt, and there's me back there. <gasps> there he is. Why is he so hot? He's 6'2". <laughs> I'm 6'2". <laughs> he did everything for this film. The most expensive part of it was actually buying film stock to shoot on. But since that was his most expensive material, he had to be careful what he would shoot. He had to come up with creative solutions for everything. If they messed up, instead of cutting and redoing it, he would cut to a different angle and cut around all the good parts. And in the end, it creates a working, intelligible sequence. And despite the fact that this was such a quick process to film, the final product looks like it took forever because of how many different different angles and cuts there are. It looked like they were shooting all day, but they weren't. He would set up different shots mid take. So a lot of cinematographers will shoot with a fixed lens that can't zoom. There's a few reasons why you would do this, but Robert was shooting with a telephoto lens and uh, during conversations where he knew he'd be cutting back and forth, he would be zooming in on the actors to like match intensity. So back in the edit, it would like be seamless, but it looks like they set up three different camera angles and shot it three different times. It's like a true rebellious, spirit. He took it around the American film festival circuit, telling some festivals how much the film cost and telling others that it actually cost a lot more than it did to see if they would buy it. And they did. To put in perspective how cheap this film was made for after it was picked up by Columbia Pictures, who distributed it internationally, they spent $200,000 to transfer the 16 millimeter film print to a 35 millimeter film print and to remaster the sound. It, it, the movie cost less than that. Robert Rodriguez is definitely one of my favorite directors, but none of his movies are anywhere close to being my favorite movie. His films are fun and self-described as goofy. It's goofy shit and there's so many great setups and punchlines and visual gags. It's, it's truly filmic. I was watching Desperado with a few friends a few weeks ago and somebody asked me why they think Robert Rodriguez chose to do Spy Kids after Desperado, which is the sequel to El Mariachi in which Antonio Banderas is recapping as the mariachi. My response was, I think Spy Kids is actually a very natural progression from Desperado. And he kind of laughed and blew me off until he saw this. So many of his films, even the more violent and intense ones, are filled with goofy setups and goofy memorable moments and big characters. And so many people want to work with him because he runs a very efficient and very fun film set. He's not the guy. I am. He's worked with Cheech Marin like half a dozen times and I laughed my ass off when he when he said this in the Spy Kids commentary. Cheech is another guy that I work with a lot. I think, I think I've only worked with him a total of maybe six days though because whenever I make a movie with him, I always shoot his parts out in a couple of days. Those become Cheech days. And all of these things that I really appreciate about Rodriguez, Robert can all be exhibited through the Spy Kids films, almost like better than some of his other films. <laughs> And the Spy Kids films themselves carry over a lot of his creative philosophy directly into the themes of the movies. Floop is not this joyous, confident guy that Junie imagined him as. Floop, as a creative, has to balance the creative vision he wants to achieve with something that can make him a lot of money. His decisions makes his investors mad, but all he wants is for his show to be better. A conflict I'm sure Rodriguez felt when taking his indie film production style into Hollywood. <laughs> 
And it's the thing that allows him to finally be able to create what he sees as his perfect show is when he asks Junie for advice. And it's Junie, the child's perspective that gives Floop the thing that ultimately improves his show. And that was Robert's philosophy when creating Spy Kids. He wanted to create a movie that felt like it was written and created by a kid. And he later actually collaborated with his kid, his seven-year-old kid, on Shark Boy and Lava Girl, which just makes that movie so much more charming knowing that. Spy Kids 2 has such a raw, creative energy to it. Robert Rodriguez turned down a larger budget to do the sequel to Spy Kids because he wanted to come up with creative solutions to save money for the purpose of giving the movie a homemade feel. And I believe that the more complex a picture gets, the simpler the process needs to be. But in being creative, it's, it's why you get up in the morning when you're making a movie. You want to be creative. You want to be challenged creatively and think, how am I going to pull this off? I don't have the money. I don't have the time. And, and you're so much more excited. Everyone gets so much more excited about the project when, when they're having to really use their heads and really think. So I went and dove and shot these underwater caves and formations for all the underwater work so that we would have a real background to mix them in so it wouldn't be just all computerized. So I went to the Bahamas and shot some, some real sharks. Oh, watch out. So you're feeding them to make them friendlier for the divers? I've done that now a few times. You need to close your eyes. Why? Just keep them shut, all right? When they were building sets for the first Spy Kids, before the sequel was greenlit, he was thinking about how they could reuse sets for the sequel, and they did. He was offered to create franchise films like X-Men, Superman, and Planet of the Apes, but he was like, no, that stuff's not Robert. What is Robert is Spy Kids thumbs. Something that I had been teaching myself over a course of several films was how to do visual effects so that I would be my own effects supervisor. Usually if you wanted to have effects in a movie, you would hire someone, a specialist. We shoot him sitting, then we shoot her sitting there, flop her shot, and instantly, it just doubled the size of the set. What we did is we built a miniature and shot it ourselves in between takes of the kids. You know, usually on a regular movie, you have a whole other unit shooting miniatures. You know, you can have more pride in something when you can go, we did that with shoestrings and rubber bands. And Spy Kids 2 was actually considered to be one of the early innovative films that tried to make the jump from film to digital. In the early 2000s, it was still not the norm to shoot movies on digital cinema cameras. George Lucas shooting Star Wars Episode 2 on high definition Sony cameras was a major deal alongside movies like Spy Kids 2, which also boldly choose to shoot in digital. In his book, Rodriguez complains a lot about the cost and unreliability of film, a feeling he would bring with him into Hollywood as he tried to keep his films in budget. But even before he ever shot a feature film on digital cameras, he would use digital cameras to pre-shoot scenes on tape to visualize them before shooting on film. So he and whatever actors he could get to tag along would have already gone through the sequence, making it that much easier to set up and shoot during the actual filming. The digital filmmaking process allows for filmmakers and even actors to watch multiple takes right on set, which can encourage a better performance and eliminate the need for multiple redundant takes. And when you have an entire crew, the quicker you can get done, the more money you save. Robert Rodriguez has a sexy take on digital film and digital film exhibition. He said he's been downloading movies for years. In like a 2001 interview, he's watching this shit on his like CRT computer monitor. George Lucas was like, hey, I'm shooting Star Wars 2 on digital. It's great for twos. You got Spy Kids 2. You want digital for that? And Robert Rodriguez, unlike his friend Quentin Tarantino, was like, yes, I love digital. Man, I actually think I'm getting gypped when I go to a movie and I realize it's either been shot on digital or being projected in digital. Um, Martin Scorsese is trembling because of Robert. Quentin Tarantino, sad. Martin Scorsese, sad. Robert Rodriguez, six foot two and hot. Though to be fair, Martin Scorsese did say you can watch a movie on a big iPad. An iPad, a big iPad, maybe, you know? So I think that's, he gets a pass. <laughs> Sad. However, even though he previously turned down franchise works, I'm really not surprised he wants to work on the Book of Boba Fett and The Mandalorian. I haven't seen those shows, but the behind the scenes of the digital sets they use seems like something that would really appeal to Robert Rodriguez. It's a very efficient, high-tech way to make films, which is totally in line with his early adoption and embrace of digital filmmaking. And embracing all creative solutions carries forward so well in Spy Kids 2, the best gadget they receive after receiving all this cool high-tech stuff at the beginning of the film is the rubber band because once they get to the island, all of their gadgets stop working. It's a rubber band. Yeah, but it's also the world's greatest gadget. 999 uses. And the important thing is, 
you have to figure out what those uses are. He didn't want to sit there and have to think about how to spend an expensive budget. He just wanted to create bigger and better ideas. Like the scene where Carmen and Junie are talking to each other inside the cave of treasure on the island. They can't hear each other speak, but they can hear each other uh. think. That's such a creative and very memorable scene. But it's not because they spent a bunch of money on CGI and creatures and whatever. It's because they just came up with a fun idea. These films, despite being franchise pieces really have a homemade independent film feeling to them. It's made with a lot of love and care and Robert Rodriguez actually took on a lot of extra roles he didn't really know how to do on the set just because he wanted it to have that very crafty, loving vibe to it. He actually animated some of the creatures on his computer in his garage at his home because that's what Ray Harryhausen did. The, the Harry's written all over this film. I did the sound mix in my house. I did the, uh, all the editing, the music here. Um, really wanted to make it in my backyard. I wanted to go back to making a home movie. I thought, especially because this was a part two, it already has a strike against it because it has a two on it. How do you make it feel not like just a sequel? Well, I wanted to make it even more homemade than the first one. I thought it needed that personal touch. It needed that obsession. It needed that me putting everything I had into it and my crew putting everything they had into it to make it a very personal movie. Because I think the bigger the movie gets, the more personal it needs to get, the, the smaller it needs to get in order to feel genuine so it doesn't just feel like another movie just falling off the factory line. What's remarkable to me, despite everything that Robert Rodriguez had under his belt before Spy Kids, is he really discussed these movies as something that was really a part of his filmmaking legacy. He said that Spy Kids 2 was the most fun he had filming a movie since his original El Mariachi. About when you're there looking at a set or looking at it or coming up with an idea, it's not that much more work. It's actually a lot of fun. I've found out that this was the most fun I've had making a movie since probably El Mariachi. Rodriguez actually discusses that both the second and third film were actually envisioned as something else entirely before being fitted into the Spy Kids franchise. He just used what he considered to be his best ideas for action adventure kids films. He turned down a higher budget so he could have more creative freedom, not only to make the film he wanted to make, but to run the entire process how he wanted to run it. He really wanted to bring that independent film spirit into Hollywood and working through Austin, Texas and working with people who like working with him, he was able to do that. I mean, you can clown on Spy Kids 3D for its memeiness all you want, but that filmmaking process led to Sin City, which is a pretty gorgeous film made nearly entirely with digital sets. The Guardian, April 2001. I'm probably the only guy who really enjoys being in the movies. That's a pretty big statement. <laughs> and that fun loving expression really carries forward through all of his films. And despite the fact that they're all not great, you can really respect and appreciate them for what they are. Just fun, goofy action films. Some of which have a little bit more depth to them, including Spy Kids 1, 2, 3. There is a Spy Kids 4. I watched it. Who's flying this thing? I thought you were. <laughs> oh no, they do not look like pet lovers. It's bad. <laughs> It's just real bad. I think it's kind of cool that Spy Kids 4, 10 years later, had a less less of a budget than the original Spy Kids, but like the casting's all over the place, the humor's off, the villains aren't as memorable and dynamic. Uh, F uh, Jessica Alba's okay, but you know, Jeff Winger, what's his name? Joel McHale. Like, I don't hate him, I guess, but like, it's he's, he's a weird character and his charm doesn't come off in the character that's written. And then there's that talking dog which is just like every time he starts talking, the, the energy in this scene is like flat. And it just seems like whoever was doing that voice was just so disconnected from the movie. And like, I, I, there were some fart jokes in the original Spy Kids movie, sure, but there were a lot in Spy Kids 4. But let me tell you, when Junie walks in and that fucking theme song plays, that's the greatest movie I've ever seen. Holy shit. So anyways, I'll see y'all soon.